Bitcoin as digital gold. That was actually the way we were thinking about it at the, t- at the time. Uh, deploy in Bitcoin and uh, you'll you'll do well, kind of thing. We were um, fully open to the opp- opportunity of, of decentralized finance. In a sense, DeFi hopefully will become useful by being applied as a primitive, as a building block to the applications and marketplaces we're trying to build. And then in that way, we'll see it become much bigger. The open movement, the ability to share data, um, the ability to share research, that has been the you know the origin, that has been the Petri dish from which all the notable inventions have, have come. I, I think that the other side of the, the, the impact of AI on Web3, uh, the, of just a very specific one, is that if we look at the way in which AI co-pilots are tracking and their ability to create applications, that we're going to go from a situation where there are sort of relatively few Solidity programmers and it's incredibly hard to audit uh, smart contracts to a world where... Welcome to Epicenter the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. I'm Sebastian Quizio, and I'm here with my co-host, Frédéric Ernst. Today, we're talking with Richard Muirhead, who is co-founder of Fabric Ventures and also on the NEAR Foundation Council. So Fabric has been a longtime VC in the Web3 and crypto industry, and you know it's been a long time coming since we should have had Richard on the show. But you know, 10 and a half years later, here he is to share Fabric's latest uh, thesis, which is about the intersection of crypto and AI. And we'll also get in some other topics like investing in crypto. And you know, as a emerging manager, I'm also very interested in uh, asking Richard a bunch of uh, questions about how he runs his fund. So this is also sort of a good opportunity here to, uh, to learn about crypto investing. Before we talk to Richard, here are our sponsors this week. This episode is brought to you by Gnosis. Gnosis builds decentralized infrastructure for the Ethereum ecosystem. With a rich history dating back to 2015 and products like Safe, CowSwap, or Gnosis Chain, Gnosis combines needs-driven development with deep technical expertise. This year marks the launch of Gnosis Pay, the world's first decentralized payment network. With a Gnosis card, you can spend self-custody crypto at any Visa-accepting merchant around the world. If you're an individual looking to live more on chain or a business looking to white label the stack, visit gnosispay.com. There are lots of ways you can join the Gnosis journey. Drop in the Gnosis DAO governance form, become a Gnosis validator with a single GNO token and low cost hardware, or deploy your product on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis chain. Get started today at gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Cars One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Cars One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Richard, thanks for joining us on the show this week. Fantastic to be here. Um, uh, don't tell anybody that it took me 10 and a half years to get on the show because um, they might make a, a jab at my punctuality. Um, um, and, and, and also, uh, yeah, she, somebody you uh, reminded me, uh, said just then, sorry, reminded me of uh, Harry Stebbings with his 20 Minute BC show, uh, where he, is, he has done an incredible job of getting uh, great guests on and talking to them about the the art of venture investing and build that into a great franchise. So I wouldn't be shy of that. That seems like a a, a, f- a fantastic way to go. Not that I necessarily have anything to to add to, add to the picture. And also, I almost appeared on his his show right at the be- very beginning, but it didn't happen. And so maybe I'll have to wait until he's on his tenth year as well before I get to do that. <laughs> well, let's hope not. Uh, I mean, actually, I mean that, that that's sort of. Not entirely true because you were on our 10 year anniversary show. Uh, you, you appeared there for That's a brief true. moment, but it wasn't like a proper interview. Uh, but uh, as I understood, uh, as I've learned, I guess, like 
fairly recently, actually. Uh, you've been listening to Epicenter since uh, pretty much since the beginning, right? Yeah, somewhere. I mean, I was I look back at some of the episodes to kind of um, sort of reacquaint myself, but I know that um, I kind of got the 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 bug somewhere, went got sucked down the rabbit hole or the wormhole, as we we actually like to call it here at Fabric, um, in um, in the kind of spring of 2013, having kind of spent a a little a little while uh, building up to that. Um, but I know that I then got pulled into kind of. Uh, running one of my sort of portfolio companies in 2014 and i don't know somewhere between the kind of the autumn and the spring epicenter became a, a sort of staple part of my kind of stress relieving sort of jogging routine and reminding myself that that, that i could get back to the uh the kind of romantic glories of of uh, decentralization and bitcoin at some point which i which i finally did yeah, cool. Uh, and uh, I, I think a lot of people were listening to Epicenter while running back then, in including myself. I'd, I'd re-listen to episodes uh, sometimes, like while 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 going out for runs. When I used to run, <laughs> which is something I haven't done in a long time. But um, yeah, maybe let's you know for for folks who don't know you, dive into your background a little bit. Uh, so I mean, Fabric has been around I think since 2015, 2016. Uh, what, what were you doing before that, and how did you get involved in? I mean, how did you start a crypto fund, basically? At the moment of kind of self-indulgence to tell about the classic crypto kind of origin story, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep it on point and entertaining. Um, uh, and yeah, I've been in it long enough that I've heard a lot of crypto <laughs> origin stories. So I, I did engineering at university and, and kind of always wanted to start a, a company of some description. And I, I kind of fell in love with software, the general power of software, I mean, I, I tried my hand at it when I was kind of, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12, as I think as many folks do. Discovered, um, actually got my first computer from Clive Sinclair, if you know who he is, uh, directly for his, his parents were, were neighbors. They got the ZX81 back in kind of uh, 1981. Um, anyway, he's famous in, the, in, in England, at least, as one of the early, uh, um, you know, major protagonist stakeholders in, in the, the PC revolution. Um, and but I quickly discovered that I was not of the I didn't have strong aptitude for software development itself, um, and I I came out of university and um, did some strategy consulting, part of which was in the telecom space. And essentially, uh, along with my brother Charlie, had an uh, an epiphany uh, that there was immense power in the openness and permissionless nature of the IP protocol. Uh, internet protocol data networks that were um, rising up in the kind of early 90s, um, but that if we were going to use them to run the world's economy, uh, that they you know maybe need to be fixed for things like security and quality of service and so forth. And um, actually with the advice of someone who turned out to be a long-term collaborator, uh, Stephen Waterhouse, Seven, uh, um, we, who was an advisor, uh, we built a, a software company to run these very large-scale IP data networks, um, and you, and critically, I think in this question of kind of getting into um, the crypto decentralization space, we 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 were quite early. It turns out with using open source software, kind of in anger at an enterprise or at a kind of a carrier uh, scale. So we used uh, um, an open source uh, instantiation of of Corba. Actually, it was, it's called OmniOrb. Uh, it was a publish subscribe kind of middleware, um, and we use that uh, in order to build, you know, the, the, this product, um, and and ultimately IPO'd London Stock Exchange and then and Nasdaq, and they did a merger and then sold to Oracle, and that software is still being uh, used today, actually, to manage large, you know, IP networks. And came out of that, um, had a brief sort of uh, got a taste, and this is related again to this question of kind of getting into venture. I got um, seduced somewhat to spending some time with Axel Parners. Uh, who are obviously pretty storied and and, and famous and infamous uh, these days, uh, not least for, for Facebook. Um, back uh, now 23 years ago, when they were setting up their uh, London office, uh, actually it came about, uh, and this is, I, from, I found interesting, I actually re-energized this connection just last week at an event. I, I, I basically ended up ordering a margarita at a bar with um, a Rob Glazer, who ran Real Networks, for those of you um, who remember Real Networks from last century, um, and it's, it's still running today, um, and and Jim Breyer uh, from Axel Partners, it turns out, and he just said, hey, you should meet my 
partner, Kevin Kamoni, who's setting up in London. And for me, that interestingly, that's a, uh, one of those fortuitous connections we should always be kind of striving to kind of make. Um, I incubated a company there um, at Axel Partners, both getting a, an understanding of what it takes to kind of build a new company from scratch, the kind of somewhat daunting task of looking into the blank sheet of paper, but also learning about the Silicon Valley flavor of venture investing, uh, which I think is still something that we shouldn't necessarily just be looking to ape or copy in the rest of the world. We should be, you know, plowing our own sort of furrow, but of course we can be inspired by. And, but also built a, a second company that used a machine learning primitives to augment the function of quite sort of, of knowledge workers operating actually in the IT management space. Um, and one of the things we encountered there was a kind of coordination problem, incentivization and, and coordination problem. So how to get people to give up their data uh, um, you know, they're kind of hard won data um, for how to o operate a, a particular part of the kind of back office of a, of a bank, for example, um, when actually that very same data was was the way they were kind of clinging on to their job because <laughs> it protected their kind of little fiefdom they had. And so through those, uh, I don't know those threads are kind of fully apparent, but, you know, early work with uh, open source software, looking at machine learning primitives before they became famous with like AlexNet and ImageNet and so, and so forth at the beginning of last decade, um, and looking at incentive structures and collaboration of people. When I stumbled into uh, Bitcoin, uh, and I, I genuinely don't know who it was, but I met somebody who was involved in Bitcoin as early as January 2009, uh, but I really don't know who, 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 who that was. I can remember the type of person who was in, in Switzerland. And, and then it, it was sort of re-energized as a conversation by my friend and colleague, uh, Stephen Waterhouse, aka Seven, um, in the spring of 2013, and um, and for me, just very quickly, the kind of sh the, the shoe dropped. Um, not just you know, should we say, into their native money? Uh, you know, not just the kind of the kind of extensibility, arguably, of the possibilities for the, of the blockchain, but also I can remember particularly um, really getting excited by the concept of instantiating, you know, if not laws, but organizational principles into code in uh, in, in what were called DAX and then became DAOs in, in 2013. Then in terms of investing, I kind of somewhat reluctantly hung up my kind of my uh, proverbial soccer boots sometime in 2009, 2010 when I sold my second company to BMC and, and then decided angel investing and was looking for um, a thesis that was felt sufficiently impactful in some senses, sufficiently crazy uh, that it that it really kind of you know just might work, and and so th that's what Bitcoin, blockchain, you know, crypto writ large, Web Web three, open web. Let's we maybe we'll get into it. that's what they became, and that's kind of the the genesis of uh, Fabric. Were you inclined to kind of start another company as a founder rather than kind of a fund? Oh, that gave me severe heartbreak. Um, the concept <laughs> of not. Um, starting another company again, and in some senses, I have both. I have successfully scratched that itch by building Fabric um, uh, over these last years. Um, but in some other senses, it probably gets in the way of of me uh, uh, focusing just on the <laughs> on the in the vesting. And certainly, we have experimented a lot with quite hands on in our activities. You know, researching what's going on, hacking around here and there in some of the kind of products mining, staking, validating, nothing that we have scaled particularly within Fabric, but we try and keep our hand in in that, in that regard. So um, so I think, but yeah, but it was a bit of a heartache definitely to kind of not, not to not build another company because whatever you do and look at, you know, I, I, I did not have ho household name success. I had some okay success, but I felt like I had way more uh, kind of like tire tracks in my back and scars on my, you know, scar tissue from things that had not quite gone the way I wanted them to, then I had some successes. So you're like, oh, next time I'm going to really do it just right and we're going to kind of get escape velocity. But yeah, it was a, it's a good question, Frederica. Bridget, can you talk about your fun thesis for, for, for a bit? So, I mean, you started um, a number of years back and it kind of changed over time. So maybe, maybe maybe tell us where you started and where you're at now. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I think inevitably these things get a little blurred over over time, and you tend to have kind of the clarity of hindsight. Uh, and I, but I'll try to avoid that as 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 much as possible. 
but I, I kind of mentioned that that we were looking for a thesis. I found to start a venture firm in Europe was quite challenging if you didn't have tens of millions of your own money to deploy in it and back sort of 10, 15 years ago. So having, uh, I used my kind of company starting kind of instincts that having a, a focus, a distinctive specialization and trying to sort of catch a wave would be a good way to, to tackle it. So it was kind of on the hunt for something. Um, and uh, I had, in, as I also mentioned in the back of my mind, some of the, um, you know, the principles of, you know, digital money, should we call it, some of the the power of getting people to collaborate and share their data. But I um, had not looked too deeply at what was going on with Bitcoin. And then um, I was uh, exchanging messages with with Seven in the spring of 2013, uh, you know, asking, and he was over in Silicon Valley and I was in um, South Kensington, basically, in London. And I was like, you know, what are you up to over there? And there were two things he said. He said he was looking at a lot of at VR and Bitcoin. And 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 so, uh, as a result of that conversation, I sort of sort of dove in, um, uh, and blockchain dot info blockchain dot com was was obviously a big company you know over here that was kind of active, and that was one of my first ports of call. Um, and there was Made Safe, and there was a whole bunch of other people who were active, um, and we ended up working together on the investment in Bitstamp in um, the autumn of that year. But in terms of the thesis, when we were thinking about how to benefit. You know, to to p- deploy capital to benefit from the space, there was still a little bit of a backstop instinct that you know, look, Bitcoin is digital gold. That was actually the way we we're thinking about it at the t- at the time. Uh, deploy in Bitcoin, and uh, you'll you'll do well, kind of thing. And actually, of course, it'd be interesting. I mean, we're talking like between a price of so ninety eight dollars to four hundred, you would have done pretty 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 well in, compar- in comparison to any different funds. Of course, that is partly hindsight because you can't say, "Oh, you should have just done that," because that would be a very concentrated bet to to take with no diversification. And it and and it and on that point, it did feel at that time that there was. Um, I, I tried to conceive of all of the different things you might invest in, the projects to invest in, in order to build a portfolio as an investor, and it felt relatively limited at that point in time. And I think, of course, it it, it really took. Um, I sort of January, February 2014, when kind of Gav, uh, we were co- co-hosted an event with Coin Scrum, and and he involved, you know, announced um, he presented Ethereum for the first time, and then you started seeing this obviously the shift to kind of generalized smart contract platforms, and then being able to apps be able to be built on top of that, and obviously the, the DeFi world we know um, that started to 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 make it look like the thesis you could have a thesis just around that space. Um, I think then, of course. And this is one of the things I think everybody in this space has to wrestle with. When when the price is up, everybody is massively positive and, uh, and often over exuberant um, and thinks that anything is possible. Uh, and of course, actually, I find ironically, it's at that point in time that limited partners or folks who are a bit detached from the space tend to get jolted into action to look at investing. Of course, it is ironic because, of course, maybe it's when the price is not so high that you want to be <laughs> preparing to to deploy. Um and you know we we went through that um, winter of fourteen fifteen um, when everybody sort of started concocting the the kind of it's not Bitcoin it's blockchain kind of narrative and going a little bit sort of B two B you know let's look at how that can be deployed um, in companies like R three looking at the kind of uh, the back office for uh, for banks and so forth I, I think whilst we definitely didn't dismiss that we. Um, remained believers uh, in the the openness, permissionlessness, and so forth of the the kind of the public bo- blockchain movement. It actually reminded me of when in I would have, would have been like ninety six, ninety seven, or something. Um, there was there was a chief scientist of, of UUNet, one of the powerful internet service providers at the time. I remember sort of spending uh, some time with him um, and. He was collaborating with IBM, and IBM was trying to get everybody to build sort of sort of private intranets uh, to solve, you know, supply chain problems and to uh, uh, share information between, you know, for, with GE and Ford and all of their kind of clients. And it was the equivalent of a kind of permissioned blockchain. And those projects didn't go anywhere. Yeah, I mean, ultimately there was the adoption of the underlying technologies. Um, but those projects went nowhere, and it's and it's and so I think for me it, it it echoed that, and so we kind of remained kind of on the kind of public uh, direction. 
so both Max Mersch and then Julien Tevenard of the, those forthcoming years joined. And Julien in particular was very early looking at the the DeFi space and looking at the arbitrage of, of opportunities before between exchanges, for example. But, you know, prior to that, something that that occurred to us, but you know, other people exploited and, or or took advantage or profited from um, uh, in a way that that I, I certainly never did. Um, and so we were um, fully open to the opp- opportunity of, of decentralized finance. Um, I think uh, it's an interesting question where we we have reached with the the uh, maturity of that. I think. Uh, we may be at some kind of local top, but I think it's it's really a component of something much much bigger. Uh, I guess the only other thing worth mentioning in terms of our thesis is that just because it had because of the nature of where I'd come from in terms of building companies that try to you know harness data to 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 uh, you know gathered from you know, people in kind of networks, I um, we always saw uh, ultimately Bitcoin blockchain decentralized data structures, uh, the coordinating power thereof of tokens that are native to them as a way of organizing the world's data from the bottom up. The, the, the emergent power of properties of those networks are the powerful thing that if we're going to have a chance of getting the right data to the right you know, algorithm at the right time in the right format so that we can really all, all benefit to the maximum from you know what we now see accelerating in the world of AI. Then there's a beautiful marriage between those two uh, movements, and that was for a long time in a quarter what we pitched, and it's gone in and out of favor, but it certainly seems to be much more in favor today. So let, let's talk about the AI thesis. Uh, you know, as we were preparing for this, I, I was reminded that in like 2017, 18, th- there was a moment where blockchain and AI that narrative had emerged amongst you know all the other narratives at the time defi this this enterprise blockchain uh idea that was floating around in the 2015s to i guess like 17 18 era and i remember at the time i remember that narrative just feeling very cringe to to a lot of us folks building in defi and permissionless networks and we had people pitch us ideas for the podcast and maybe sponsors and stuff like people reaching out to us to be on the show. Uh, you know, sort of pitching this idea of like AI and blockchain are the perfect technologies, but it just felt so cringe at the time. And to me, at least I, I didn't see any sort of promise or, or, or utility in those two technologies merging and somehow becoming complementary to each other. Uh, what's different now and why is it why is this narrative now making a resurgence and what 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 sort of specific technological advancements perhaps have now made it actually interesting and and something worth looking at yeah so so i guess one of the things i, I draw from that actually is that that um if we all battle you know market high market low with the emotions attached to that we also battle with the fact that you know trying to sort of actually just stick to what we believe might be right and trying to ignore the other people the opinions of other people which might be you know just fighting that instinct of of uh you know uh shying away from what feels a little sort of you know cringy should we say um although that being said of course you know and i mean we probably wouldn't get into it but ai's got a long history when it the kind of the dawn of the ai age has been heralded heralded and it's turned out to be a kind of a, a false horizon uh you know going back decades of course um and i think that you know, it's pretty well documented. One of the things that is different has turned out to be different now is that, you know, just the computational power and the quantity of data available to train then some innovations in, you know, the types of AI being, you know, generally used, obviously notably the trans transformer um style, you know, LLMs, they um th- that has really kind of be taken things to the next level in terms of uh, the wow factor for anybody using GPT three, let, let alone GPT four. Um, so obviously that is that mainstreaming makes it different on the AI side. I think in terms of the kind of the connection between the two, I think first starting with the the kind of Web three side of things. Um, you know, I think there's often, in a sense, a similar challenge later the the, the feet of Web three, which is like when are we going to have mainstream apps? Uh, when's that going to happen? And, and and I often sort of get into and go, hold on a second, can we just calibrate, uh, you know, how long it's actually been and for how far we've come? 
you know, we just take a measure how many dApps being built, how many developers being involved, uh, how sophisticated a Web3 stack that's being built and and say best part of three trillion in 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 market cap that is is kind of being uh sort of generated in value. That that feels like a, a pretty impressive. And you know, that um that I think that work that has gone in to build a Web3 stack that it, that truly can scale to support, should we say, native on-chain payments, uh, to, to su- support sort of consumer-grade uh, applications that has the levels of abstraction in it so that um, you don't have to care about which L2 you're on or indeed preferably which L1 you're on um, and uh, or, or anything uh, about specific to the naming service of, of you know, the aforementioned L1. You know, I think we we forget about how much um, has happened, and I think we do it does feel like we're at a, a tipping point uh, there. And then I think that um, all of the work that's gone into creating the DeFi ecosystem, uh, we always thought about those as kind of necessary primitives or building blocks in that overall stack. You know, this is one. You know, this is a the first time we've had a wave of software that has the ability to make and keep financial promises, which sounds like a pretty powerful uh you know tool um and and i think that's where um the marriage with um ai uh comes comes about uh because um we've seen and i think really comes about because ai um we've seen how the choke point for that has been the capital required not so much the electricity consumed but the sheer capital required to buy the gpus and get them in a timely fashion in order to train uh, models. Um, uh, there are all sorts of choke points around um, electricity distribution and even generation. If you want to have that as sort of native geography that are emerging, but I think it's going to turn now and, and to 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 data, um, and that you know a lot of the kind of open sourced and commonly available data sets that, that are of the scale required for LLMs has already been consumed. But there's a huge amount that is still trapped in, for example, social media. And I think famously, you know, Zuckerberg has said, you know, we're not training Llama 3 on our social data. But if we can find a way in which we can respect people's privacy and perhaps even reward people, incentivize people and reward them for sharing that data, um, there's a huge treasure trove of opportunity. And I think we can then obviously go beyond social uh, network data to health data and 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 the like, and maybe deeper personal financial data, and and so I think that's the opportunity now, the maturity of the stack now that is there, and then it's the opportunity to use those, you know, the capabilities of that stack to go and use token economics to incentivize the, the sharing of that data. I, th- I think one of the most interesting applications for crypto and AI. At least the one, the one that I find the most useful uh, is this idea of user-owned AI, or um, where blockchains effectively act as a way for uh, users to own their data, um, to uh, leverage their data if they wish to sell their data to um, to organizations and, and folks building models. I think this 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 notion is kind of uh, also emerged previously in, in, in crypto when talking about social networks and creating data networks effectively. I think, I think that's one of the most interesting sort of uh, intersection of crypto and AI, aside from the obvious you know, marketplace for compute, for compute, right? And marketplace for GPUs, which is a sort of obvious uh, uh, use case. In, in the case of, 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 um, of user-owned AI, Given how we've seen Web two aggregate to very large players, and those have become very powerful, and and in, in specifically in the AI vertical, have become very powerful. Do you, do you think that it's even possible or conceivable that you know we have user generated AI or user owned AI in like in ten years that that is even a, a significant enough par- portion of the AI market to even matter? I, I hope it's possible. Uh, it's been characterized by uh, Michael Casey and his co-author as uh, kind of our greatest fight, um, I think, in his, his sort of recent book. And 
And look, um, if we if we go back and look at it, it it's it's clear that the um, if you follow the money, the 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 natural concentrating tendency of capitalism that uh, we've seen very evident in Web two, and that this is already you know is clearly further exaggerated uh, in uh, with the kind of prevalence of, of or the rise of AI, uh, and like it's just driven by we've seen it time and again um, that there are okay step back a bit the the open movement the ability to share data um the ability to share research that has been the you know the origin that has been the petri dish from which all the notable inventions have have come but what happens unfortunately obviously and we can observe this is that there are a few milestones reached in that research and the aggregation of the, you know using the benefit of that data and then people close off their models um i think just recently uh uh, Francois Cholet from uh, Google went as far as to say that, you know, uh, along the lines of OpenAI has put back frontier research in AI uh, by uh, several years, three, four, five years, since it closed down uh, through its actions, the publishing of that research. Um, and also by virtue of the fact that it has popularized LLM so much that it's sucking the oxygen away from other uh, forms of, uh, of research. So I think we need to remember the power of openness that's there, that if we're not careful, this concentrating force, you know, um, uh, you know, steals from us. Um, and I, I think that at every level of the stack, and we would think of the stack as, you know, uh, say, say compute, data, um, models, talent, and governance, um, you know, at every layer, there is the potential to use a, a token economic driven model Perhaps combined with an, a new form of open source license for the for the models and the and the data that has been generated, in order to give everybody a share. However, that's easy to coin a phrase somewhat as user end AI, but there are many components to make that 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 happen. Obviously, um, and you know, I think at each layer you mentioned, you know, clearly we'll see you know Airbnb for GPUs, and and we've seen obviously there are great companies like you know. Um, Jensen and protagonists like Acash and, and 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 so forth that are out there kind of building things. The real challenges there, of course, of of getting and and it's always I always think of this a little bit as the martini problem. I think it's I think it was a seventies martini ad is like any time, any place, anywhere or something. Presentation of a martini, but anyway, it's it's the how do you get the right comp type of compute power power available at the right price and in, in the right spot in the network at the right time. To do what it needs to, you know, to, to do. That's some of the challenges because there's a difference, obviously, between training, for example, high compute and and and, and inference. You know, a requirement for low la latency. You know, that matching algorithm of supply and demand is very challenging. And the same applies on, you know, on on the data set. How do you and uh, how do you get that to work? And so that's what what people are kind of are wrestling with. But I think this is a watershed moment. Either we get a bit of a vicious cycle where everything gets extremely concentrated, which I think there are very strong arguments philosophically is a bad thing. Mm. Uh, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Uh, and without getting into kind of, you know, politics and uh, the last sort of century or so. And then secondly, um, so we can believe in philosophically that's the right thing to do. But secondly, I think we can actually believe that. Um, and I've been trying, trying, thinking of the best way to kind of articulate this, but because I think we've we've not seen it yet, sort of win out. We were an early investor, for example, in Ocean Protocol, which was looking to kind of marry, um, you know, create a data marketplace. And one of the key things is that 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 there is kind of no easy mo marketplace for a large marketplace for for all types of data. It's it's always about kind of very specific data in a specific, tinier, more you know, more uh, applied marketplace where the value is. And then you have to be able to negotiate the value of the data at that point in time. And a lot of companies that build software effectively are, are doing that negotiation on behalf of that data set. And so we need to create something that's similar to that, that allows for those collectives that own that data to to negotiate on the fly or the promise of the value of that data in, in, adv in, in advance. And I think that's a, it's an area of research and a, of invention for, I think, kind of for founders. And and, and what that is in my mind's eye is a, rather than, this is a crude metaphor, but kind of rather than saying 
we're going to concentrate everything around the Ford Motor Company, and there's going to be one type of car, and it's and then, by the way, you can have any color as long as it's black, and it's going to you know the the mass production engine is going to be fed, and and do, the profits are going to be concentrated like that. What we need actually is is to ultimately end up with, and I said it was a, a, a you know a metaphor, an analogy. You want to end up with having all of the different variants of vehicle you could possibly imagine that fills out all of the utility curve um, uh, the, that that exists in this in this space, and we need a much more adaptive, um, organic uh, type of system than you're going to get from something that's command and control and centralized and 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 so forth. And you need, I think, what you can get from all of the great work that's been done within the Web three uh, community. So I think technically, it could be much better than the the centralized alternative however if we don't find a way in which we make it economically better and not just economically better in the long term but in the short term for small groups of people you know it, it, to your point sebastian it might be hard to win um because the the kind of follow the money forces are very strong so that kind of covers a lot of the decentralized ownership aspects we've also seen projects and we ourselves at Gnosis have not been completely innocent in this, at actually putting agents on chain, right? So in the beginning, we did things like we said, okay, this is a prediction market. I'll give you 10 die. Um, this is how it works. Trade on it sort of thing. But actually, we've progressed to the point where we can just, you know, spin up an agent on chain and say, hey, you have 100x die. Make me some money. And the, the bot goes out and does just that. So um, obviously, there are very real concerns here as to how wise that is, right? Do you want to put something that um, that in principle could compete with a human and have different set of uh, things it optimizes for um, on a chain that you can't turn off? Um, do you have thoughts as to that, Richard? I mean, I think, look, I, I, I'm, I don't fall into the camp of uh, there suddenly being... Um, an acceleration towards the singularity um, uh, when these things um, start teaching themselves, um, and and that happens overnight. That being said, the the ability to to teach itself, uh, an agent or a model to refine itself, um, you know that kind of second derivative, that is something for us to watch out for. Uh, you know, I think uh, Mustafa Suleiman, Suleiman, for example, would be kind of a t in agreement on that and. Um, but you know, I will leave those those deeper elements of the kind of the precariousness of the of kind of the AI gift uh, to the, those who are focusing, f you know, fully on it. I mean, but I will um, I will say, I guess where it comes up is, do we want uh, you know closed AI? Let's call it that, owned by corporations and governments, where the choice is made possibly by a very few people, who who. Um, uh, who who has that power and who can harness that power or do we want something that is more openness open and inspectable i think i go for the open and inspectable and wide widely distributed uh, option and that you know maybe we even reach a point where we are in a dynamic equilibrium of 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 mad as they call it of mutually assured destruction uh, with with these things maybe that's some kind of endpoint we reach but but look you know, knock on wood, it, it seems to be in something that has actually, in some respects, at least helped out in the context of, you know, our transition from the kind of wartime, second wartime Cold War and, and, and the sort of nuclear destruction. Again, I'll touch wood a, a couple more times. Um, so, but but on, but I guess on the, on the question of, you know, do we want to give effectively kind of persistent autonomy to agents on chain that can do things? It, it feels like it might be uh, fine, and, and indeed, unless it can teach itself to adapt into something that you don't expect, um, and maybe that the problem is we don't know in advance whether that's going to happen. I think it's going to be quite hard to predict what's going to happen with with markets. I think they're going to become sort of increasingly, you know, uh, uh, perfect, but maybe they're going to become increasingly volatile as uh, as, uh, as well. Um, and then I think. Um, I, I think that the other side of the the, the impact of AI on Web three, uh, uh, just a very specific one, is that if we look at the way in which AI copilots are tracking and their ability 
to create applications that we're going to go from a situation where there are sort of relatively few Solidity programmers and it's incredibly hard to audit uh, smart contracts to a world where um, actually, you know, and we need to watch out for this, that, that vulnerabilities are possible to spot using AI, perhaps, but obviously therefore we can use it to audit them. And indeed it's possible to use multimodal um, developer co-pilots to create, you know, a complete the complete stack of front end decentralized front end middleware and smart contracts for um you know uh whatever you know might be uh, some kind of a, a, whether it's a gig marketplace or a um you know whether it's an, a, a decentralized exchange of some description um and therefore the the kind of community strength that some of these l1s have sort of starts to fade into the background so i don't know what you've been thinking about um uh, on that particular particular topic, Frederica, because you seem to be not, nodding your head a little bit, that it's, it could it could change the dynamics, the competitive dynamics quite quickly. Yeah, no, I completely agree. So I, I totally see the dangers. I think stopping is not a great option because because we can't force everything, uh, to, we can't force every every participant to kind of stop, right? So kind of, I'd rather we, we with kind of like, hopefully good intentions, um, are in the mix as well. Um, because otherwise, if you say, oh, this is a little bit too dangerous for me, um, if someone else continues, that does you no good, um, you know, in, in the larger sense. Absolutely. Uh, certainly there are people I respect on the AI, so AI side, including Nathan Benek um, at Air Street Capital and, um, you know, folks, um, uh, you know, who have commented that obviously the hue and cry around, you know, let's uh, let's slow down on AI. Let's regulate it. It is a kind of classic form of kind of regulatory capture uh, by you know big tech, um, and you know it's self-serving to say slow down if what you're doing is meanwhile, you know, having a hearty breakfast and getting ready to sprint into the lead. Um, you know, uh, so so I think uh, yeah, I would agree. Um, I think we need to we need to keep going, and as many people need to keep going as possible, um, and it, it's. Ultimately, it can be extremely hard to put the continuity back back in the bottle. But I do think a lot of the principles around transparent, you know, uh, you know, governance, decentralized governance, incorruptibility of various, you know, points of governance, collective ownership, modern mutualism, if you will, which is one of our you know, terms we like, um, are good principles, you know. And and in some from Web three to apply to AI, and like in some senses, you know. Um, you, you might uh, might think that it's hard to imagine of a bigger use case than in reinventing money and the world's financial system, but actually, sort of re you know reinventing you know and I think you know crypto still has this opportunity to reinvent our our relationship with our personal money, but actually what's going to happen with AI is we're going to reinvent our relationship with the use of our personal data, um, and and I think the freedom to you know to have that personal relationship that direct relationship is like effect, effectively a human right um and but not just a human right in a kind of a kind of um it's nice to have but but essential for the kind of balance we want in society yeah i agree i think uh i think the next 100 years and maybe even less you know we'll 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 see like tremendous societal shifts caused by ai um and and we need to really think as a society uh, how how the data uh, is used and, and also like how the AI um, is kept safe, sort of aligned with our objectives as a species and um, doesn't cause chaos, <laughs> which is a tall order. But um, yeah, let maybe shifting gears here a little bit. What other interesting trends are you seeing in this space? And I'd like to ask you a little bit about DeFi because I mean, we like there's been tons of innovation in DeFi over the last, you know, four, five, six years, uh, but it, it appears as though innovation is slowing down a little bit. There's not m very much that's sort of new. It's like a lot of re uh, rehashed ideas and optim optimizations. Uh, do, do you see DeFi? Have we reached like the top, or or, or is there more innovation to come in by way of like? Uh, new types of applications that you know really redefine um, our interaction with finance. 
so I think we're nowhere near the top. I think, but I think that um, that realizing that um, the capital that DeFi can handle is not just your financial capital, but your social capital, um, and 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 different, um, uh, and that you know, a decentralized applications are going to be intrinsically social, and they're going to have the ability to to also handle uh, transactions within them. Um, and how those all get intermingled, I think, is going to be the, the the opportunity. I mean, we see people looking at building decentralized exchanges that can handle not just you know fungible, but also but various combinations of non fungible token. Um, and so, I think that there is um, opportunity in, in that direction, and I think you'll we'll see a collision between, um, should we say? Um, AI's hunger for data, de decentralized social media, and a way it gives you the the ability to, you know, mint data that you own, and DeFi's you know ability to uh, create marketplaces, um, and and I think sort of that there's an intersection there that's very valuable. And your and also I guess it, it's not if you think about it, it's just not co not just content data. It's also things like uh, health data. So if, um, and we've seen how DeFi can, you know, and the world casino that we sort of once the, you know, the web three has sort of stumbled into, um, can be incredibly sort of good at, at, at creating these highly liquid marketplaces, even if it is with money that is quite hot, as in it's there while the going is good and then it sort of disappears. And I think sort of one of the next challenges is to how to apply that to data sets that are actually where the, the kind of value is less, um, you know, volatile, but, you know, the, there's, uh, for example, sort of health data, it's more long lasting, but you can use the principles of creating liquidity and and bootstrapping marketplaces that we've learned how to do on, on the DeFi side and, and, and have them kind of permute across. So I think in a sense, DeFi hopefully will become useful by being applied as a primitive, as a building block to the applications and marketplaces we're trying to build. And then in that way, we'll see it become much bigger. And I also think on its own legs, I mean, like, I guess we could ask ourselves the question, you know, do we yet have an app? And I think, by the way, as a sort of sidebar, we probably feel that apps are disappearing. But do we have, you know, a, a sidekick, you know, set of experiences, continuous sort of streaming application experience that is sort of tuned into the value that we have and all of the data that represents our credit score and that continuously surfaces for us um, from, you know, a a financial marketplace where there is, you know, not human intervention um, and presents it to us for, for whatever opportunity we're looking at at that particular point in time. Well, that's not happened yet. And I, that seems to me the, the kind of the core, still the core open finance or decentralized finance opportunity and a lot of the ability to do that is only just um is only just coming to pass you're talking about sort of this emerging use case of uh digital asset managers that make use of ai agents uh to find like sort of optimized positions for one's portfolio that 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 kind of use case yeah, it could be optimizing the positions in your portfolio, but it could just be be saying, you know, uh, like I'm I'm going to buy some clothes for delivery tomorrow. Um, I'm gonna um, I need to use credit for that. Maybe I have free credit. Maybe it's only two days. If I've sort of said I'm going to return it, but but to to negotiate the credit for you, you know, automatically in the, in the background as part of that transaction. Um, also simultaneously, of course, like. Um, capture a tokenized set of you know um uh, information about that interaction that becomes attached it's part of your kind of data resource that becomes attached to your profile which then in turn feeds or <laughs> feeds into kind of future possible offers of credit that you will you will be given sort of instantaneously next time uh, you need to do that or indeed not just credit um incentives loyalty or whatever um i think that the the, the loyalty space w which was Something I remember looking at a company called Offermatic, best part of 15 years ago, um, which was looking to kind of use your transaction data across all of your different accounts to give you better, you know, loyalty. You know, 
we surely we want to get to the point where all of the information you know around who you are and how you transact is used productively for you hopefully um to you know to to give you the offers and the loyalty and and so forth that you want and then on a kind of permissioned basis you get those offers that you, that you really you you care about rather than having a ad revenue driven model that's sort of inbound it's more kind of permissioned kind of permissioned marketing that takes place so i think all of those are you know open commerce open loyalty open payments uh, you know, and the, mar- the the DeFi marketplaces behind them, they're all interwoven. And I think we have uh, have barely got anywhere uh, with respect to those so far. And, and, this, and it, 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 within that is the kind of, you know, real world asset marrying to any concept that exists today. Um, we know with that world is is um, is tricky, and and the reason why obviously it's easier in the kind of world casino cases when you have a fungible asset and it's all natively on chain, and you're staying on chain. That's the easiest place to get those marketplaces going. Um, but I, I'm sure we will get there. Yeah. So I'm mean, sp- speaking about trends here. Maybe looking back in your uh, journey as uh, as an investor in the space. What, which which trends, which notable trends uh, did you did you see over the years that you you thought would play out, or like you thought would become uh, a larger part of the industry, but in, ended up not. And um, you know, what did what did you learn from uh, from those? Yeah, I mean, I think I think um, we. I just mentioned one, which is I think that the loyalty was one that we thought would. Uh, uh, there was a a, a a kind of payments and loyalty company that we incubated that was Web two called YoYo. I, I remember trying to pitch my my partner. Um, Ala Feliz to make, take that on chain back in I don't know 2014 or 15 or something, and um, and you know none of that has is taken off as quickly as it might. Again, you know it's, 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 I think it's really a, qu- a question of time or timing rather than anything else. Um, I I think that on chain games is another one that 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 I, obviously I think has got challenges to to take off, and a lot of people. You know, we're investors in cartridge. A lot of people are doing a lot of work. Other firms like Lattice and so forth are to um, to build the capabilities to make that work and have sort of AAA standard games that that um, that can operate scalably, kind of you know on on chain and indeed to to, to kind of allow people to own, not just sort of uh, buy um, the various artifacts in those games and then build kind of sustainable token economies around them. I think, yeah, I think the jury's still out on gaming. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not happened. So I think that's been on, uh, so I guess we've been impatient for that, that stake off. I think, um, so I've always been uh, bullish also on just generally the power of token economics, which I kind of mentioned earlier, I think is an essential part of how we try and Overt sort of sort of massive centralization or acute centralization of kind of AI systems, but and and I think um, uh, I, I do think that there's still a lot of work to be done to work out how to um, build resilient, sustainable token economic models and to value them uh, through different st- in stages. Because I do think it's fundamentally different from you know discounted cash flow, quite linear economics of a centralized company versus the self-reinforcing effects you get in something that is more akin to a city or a forest and it's got a lot of all these different emergent properties uh, and that that arguably or at least we would argue can be rather than inevitably going from kind of productive to extractive as is you know much talked about in our kind of sphere uh, can be you know when we get that kind of platform power and platform risk can be a uh, more positive sum game uh, and more sustainable in the long term. I think that's an area that we, 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 I guess, I expected us to advance a little bit, you know, further into today. But and but I think it's still, still to come. I mean, we we were back as of, um, you know, so rare uh, back in the day. That was one of the ideas that 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 was kind of elegantly simple and sort of was almost a kind of a a trite example of what would be powerful on a kind of blockchain and uh, as has gone well. Shout out to the Strata Mafia. There you go. Uh, and and then. Um, I think uh, one one that we missed, I guess this is a little bit to do with, uh, a little bit to do with actually trying to apply a, a more typical venture capital approach to the space was that, you know, in venture capital in, in general, uh, in the, the sort of famous case study of this, when um, 
was it when when A16Z backed Bourbon that became Instagram and also Pick Please, if I remember what it was called, you know, and then they ended up on a kind of a collision path, and obviously Instagram was kind of the the winner. Um, you know that that VCs can only um, can only back one player. You have to pick a, a, a you know a, 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 someone to partner with, and you're really kind of full on with that. Whereas I think in the kind of obviously L ones, L twos, and and all of this space, a lot of a lot of folks have backed multiple different players, and then there's been enormous the opposite direction there's been enormous value generated and possible returns distributions for venture investors from a whole swathe of those l1s and l2s so that's been a bit you know i don't think everybody predicted that that would happen that it wouldn't all kind of become an ethereum game quickly or you know or some new you know winner uh and 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 so forth so i think that that's been not i don't think anybody caught well i don't know we could chat to someone who said that they called that <laughs> Um, but we, but we, we didn't, you know, play right across the field like that. So that was also kind of, should we say, a missed opportunity in that sense. Are there any specific fields uh, where basically the company pitched you, and you uh, passed and wish you didn't? Uh, I mean, look, there were definitely. I mean, off the top of my head, there were two two companies that that um, I. Why, by the way, I can, I'm I'm very bad at immediate recall of these things. But the two ones that are that are on top of my head is that you know we have a lot of time for the team at Jensen, um, and and we when we first saw them they were more enterprisey and focused, but we became decentralized and more more um, uh, you know we think they're doing great things and 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 I guess the bit I'd like to emphasize is that in you know in talking to to them and to the founders Ben and Co that they um, they're just very impressive founders and individuals, and that's a huge thing that we kind of you know index on. And you've got to be very careful to to um, to not talk yourself out of some of the challenges in these companies. And then another another one um, that we should have dug into more um, probably is is Lazy Ledger that became Celestia, um, uh, where Mustafa actually. Um, we had a discussion about him jo joining us uh, uh, in a very early when he was still at UCL. So we knew him, and we knew other people in the space, but that, that didn't happen. So, so and and look, we're um, as we as we've already been discussing, like kind of should we say deep in and deep in for AI, and you know we we think that's an important part of the future and interoperable, modular, open blockchains. We think that's also an important part of the future. So 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 we definitely kind of it was on thesis. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna now spend the, the next few minutes that we have here asking my own selfish questions as a as an emerging uh, manager of a VC fund. Uh, so, yeah, the first thing I wanted to ask you is like, you know, crypto uh, crypto valuations obviously have a um, have a premium, and that's because of the low time to liquidity. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons. At the same time, you know, VCs present themselves to teams as long-term aligned and like long-term supportive. Do, do you think that there's a, a contradiction there where, you know, short, short-term liquidity and the way market cycles operate kind of forces you, you know, if, if, if your mandate is as a fund to return cash to your investors, return capital, um, it, it is, is the, is the short-term horizon of uh, of of liquidity in crypto uh, counter to what a what a fund should you know in theory be providing to a team is also like long term support. Um, yeah, how do you think about that? And and specifically when it comes to exiting liquidity. Yeah, look, I mean, so it's definitely something we've been wrestling with six for six, seven, eight eight years. Um, uh, I and obviously, look, it's a new frontier, and so therefore, there's no reason why it should there should be a, um, a, a an un well understood or you know a quick or easy kind of answer, um, and uh, at risk of kind of giving a kind of it depends or it's somewhere in the middle answer. Um, I, I I think that venture firms should be you know venture backers should be thinking for the long term and backing those projects for the long term. You know, I, I think there's. There's clearly a segment for which that makes you know total sense. Um, I think, and that makes sense for the uh, for the projects because they want to know that you've got their backs through through thick and thin. Um, you know, there have been a you know, when it comes to the question of when to sell, 
um, you know, you, you also have a duty, obviously, to your, your limited partners to try and deliver returns. And when you come to raise your next fund, uh, you're going to be asked where your distributions are. So that you, there's a pressure on yourself uh, to be able to achieve that. That's definitely easy to, easier said in a sense uh, than than to do for for a few different reasons. Well, number one, that tension with the long term interests of the project. So I think what we try have tried to do is that is to how you need to have that relationship with the project to understand how they are hedging. And in some cases, it may well be the case that they need to hedge. Uh, they should be said to be hedging their own uh, treasury in order to you know provide for the a solid basis for you know the long-term sustainability of the project and certainly it's fair if there is that hedging going on for you to perhaps be doing similarly hedging your position at that point in time but that obviously involves a dialogue and historically maybe that dialogue has not been not been there i think it, you know it's there in the future but it is a difficult difficult dynamic to manage because projects may not want to talk about the fact that they are hedging um because that itself can have an impact impact on on, on pricing I mean, there's another dynamic for um, for venture investors, which is that uh, it, it can be said, and it has been said, that it's actually easier to buy than it is to sell. Um, so, you know, so backing a great project and getting in uh, is, is one thing, but knowing when to decide that it, it's time to to, to get off the, the train um, it can be very hard as well because you think this, there's more to go. And then afterwards, when the market's coming down, you can feel like you're trying to catch a falling knife and whatever, and you hesitate. So it's um, so I think that muscle needs to be exercised. There needs to be discipline around that. So it's a different reason in which it's, it can be difficult to get the, get it done. Um, so you need to be sympathetic to the founder of the project, be you know, integral with it, and then you need to um, uh, actually have the, the the discipline internally, the, the processes, the people, the, the the numbers, the dashboard, whatever, to think about it and, and to structure it. And I think it probably comes back to the fact that expectations are always key. Um, if you can be, as, in a, as a backer, you could say, look, I'm with you through thick and thin, but if there is go- if there is a point at which the market, you know, the liquidity has occurred and you've done extremely well um, uh, with, the, with the kind of token price, then it might set, make sense for us to hedge our position and this is how we're going to do it, and we'll make that collaborative and so forth. So I think communication and expectations would be, be crucial for making sure you remain aligned with with the founding founding team. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I think, uh, yeah, be, uh, essentially you know, requires a, me- a measured approach and, and also proximity and communication with the founder. Uh, you know, that's helpful. And one one other thing here, like you know, you you guys have looked at so many deals over the years, like possibly thousands of deals. Uh, invested in um, you know, more than a hundred. Um, uh, what 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 are the criteria that you look for? So, like when a deal comes across your desk, what are the main like three things that you look for that you know will 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 jump out at you as like this is a potential hundred x? Is it is it the team or is it weighted more towards the tech or or um, or like really true product innovation? What what are the the main things that will jump out and you know cause you to say like okay this is a priority and like we should pursue this as possibly like you know going forward with this yeah i mean so so clearly this is a, a topic that comes up you know with in many vc kind of oriented uh, um podcasts or, co- or conversations and um and and for me at least um uh, if you're talking about early stage investment uh, at the end of the day, it's you know just the team, the team, the team. I mean, it isn't because you need to see some evidence of um, how they're thinking about their initial product offering. Is this a clean, sharp insertion point that's going to get immediate traction and give them learning? Um, and is that elegant uh, in the way they've constructed it? And you need to see evidence that they've thought about maybe not the initial market, but how they can tack to a you know a, to creating even a phenomenally sized sort of market a, over time um but in a sense those are just evidence points that the team you're talking to are just incredible it, they're not it's you, it's not necessarily the answer you know the specific answer it's the it's what's gone into generating that answer and the fact that that indicates that they'll be able to come up with the next right answer when new data represents itself and they work out what to do 
And so, it, so for me, that's the, the the kind of crucial thing. I think one of the things to kind of to kind of to to get your head around as early stage investor, investor and and my friend Fred, Fred Desta, I think he called his blog post. He's, he runs Stride. Um, you know, talking about how I learned to get comfortable with risk and embrace it, or something like that. You know, and it is about it is about getting comfortable with how, how much risk there is. And in fact, particularly, of course, if you're building a venture portfolio, we are actually looking for investments for projects that are taking more risk than is than is reasonable for the founding team to be taking on a standalone basis, because we we want every every single time that project to be really swinging to be totally extraordinary in the outcome that they uh, produce. Um, but it's not just risk. It's also a kind of form of messiness that that I think can exist. So and I know that actually thinking about it, you both have these teams that are incredibly capable uh, and, and, and have thought things through and can evidence that. Um, but at the same time, getting comfortable um, that there's great risk, uncertainty, and even messiness at the, at the early stage of of those outfits. So if you, if you, if you, if you I'm, I'm answering the question of what you're maybe not looking for. If you're looking for everything to be buttoned up, then, uh, and if you're looking to ensure that you can then feel comfortable that, that, that things at the end of the day aren't going to go too wrong, that's the wrong thing to be looking for. We're looking th- at, at the, that if a whole series, if the sun, the moon, the stars, and the whatever, you know, some other celestial body kind of line up. Then how if that all happened, how incredible it could then become? That's what you're really uh, attuned to. But back, back actually makes me think of another point on actually quickly on this, this element of liquidity, which is different and distinct for for uh, the the few capital allocators uh, who are out there, rap, you know, putting lots of money into venture at the moment in in the world, uh, let alone Europe, because we still do have a bit of a dearth of that. Um, looking forward to some interest rate rate cuts, um, but the um, but the the other thing is that that we've observed is that because of this kind of organic, more city like, uh, positive sum setup of these networks that get built, where you know to take the canonical example, we don't know who Satoshi is, we don't know who the founder is, you don't have some key risks it, uh, that you might have in normal startup projects, and so that actually the fallout rate, the kind of fallout, the kind of go to zero rate is lower. Than you would see statistically from normal kind of startups, um, because of that kind of open, collaborative, community-based nature, I would I would posit um, of of these projects. And so, yeah, so you got the you got the earlier liquidity, you've got the lower fallout rate, but you still, nonetheless, if you really want to deliver exceptional fund level returns, need to be uh, you know swinging for the for the fences, as the as the, the proverbial phrase goes. Well, thank you so much for that. That's uh, great insights, and this has been a really fantastic conversation. So, Richard, thanks so much for finally coming on the podcast. Um, hopefully, we can get you on again in less than ten years. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll catch you soon. Well, well, thank you. I, I plan to still be uh, building fabric in ten years, but let's not leave it ten years. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, guys. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you very much.